Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone for staying for the Q&A. Uh, we have a couple of uh, people I'd just like to acknowledge here. Uh, our Director of Photography, J. Odedra. Co-producer Romana Gray and our executive producer Christopher Hurd from Dartmouth Films in London and we have a, a few special guests uh, who have traveled a long way to be with us uh, here today. Uh, one is Sharon Ann Lynch from Doctors Without Borders in New York. Uh, please come on up Sharon. Uh, Sharon is uh, one of the real long-time stalwart activists uh, for access to medicine, and she's going to have a message for the audience right at the end. And um, a gentleman who I'm extremely honored to have with us today, uh, all the way from Kampala, Uganda, is Dr. Peter Mujaini. in the film, uh, this gentleman's responsible for millions of people being alive today, and uh, he's one of the, uh, the real heroes of the struggle for access to antiretroviral medication and the struggle for access to medication in, in the Global South. Uh, he's the author of it, what is, in my opinion, the very best book on the subject, which is Genocide by Denial, and um, just about a week ago he launched uh, the follow-up to that book, which is A Cure Too Far. Uh, so that's his new publication. I can't wait to read it. I haven't read it yet. He's also uh, a newlywed. His uh, lovely wife is here today, Dorcas. And, uh, and uh, I would say one of the great uh, moral voices uh, of our time uh, in terms of, of uh, you know, speaking out in favor of, of human rights and uh, the idea that all of us have a right to health. Uh, which, you know, is really at the heart of, of the message we're trying to uh, get across in this film. So, um, if anybody has any questions, uh, we'd, be love, we'd love to answer them. Right at the back. Uh, well, first of all, the, the one thing I would like to clarify was President Bush, in fact, who, who announced the PEPFAR program. And I think, you know, one of the surprises in the story is that uh, President Bush actually played a relatively positive role. I think we can agree on that. Much more so than, uh, than people might have expected. And I think in retrospect of the uh, two terms of his presidency, this is the real shining, uh, you know, glory of, of his presidency. And which is why, you know, probably the one place in the world uh, where President Bush is actually um, very heartily welcomed is Africa. I think uh, Dr. Martini would probably agree with that. But maybe I'll let uh, Sharon Ann answer the question about uh, um, the, the state of play currently. So it's, it's interesting. With, um, with every year, the U.S. support for HIV treatment goes up, which is fantastic, because then we're able to leverage that to have other countries be a part of the worldwide struggle to make sure that people don't needlessly die without HIV treatment. And President Obama on World AIDS Day, which was December 1st, released his blueprint to help bring about what he called an AIDS-free generation. And the Clinton Foundation is still very active. However, one thing that I would like to talk about and direct your attention to 
is while the U.S. has been so critical in funding HIV, it has also been the big bully on behalf of Big Pharma here, to here. keep countries from exercising their rights to produce or procure generic medicines. And this is a message we have been sending for the last 12 years, and I'm going to ask you again before the end. And uh, maybe uh, Dr. Mujini could talk about the uh, state of play in terms of access to antiretroviral medica medication currently in Africa. Yeah, thank you for your kind reception, and thank you, Dylan, for making this film. The disaster, unfortunately, continues in Africa, and uh, we are not on top of the situation. Um, the people accessing treatment is about 50%. That's the reality. The deaths are no longer as bad as they used to be. Um, there is a time when we couldn't work because uh, people in our workplace were dying in such big numbers. So every day you go to work and you find, oh, so-and-so has lost his mother. So we go to that funeral. Coming back on the way from that funeral, we hear one of our own staff has died. Then on the, you know, everything came to a standstill. That situation is no longer as bad as it was then. But unfortunately, it will build up. And uh, unless action is taken, I'm afraid in the near future, we are going to have another crisis because Africa now has got about 10 million people on treatment, but the people who need treatment are about 30 million, and the number will continue to go up because although the rates of new infections are coming down, uh, the drugs help those to remain alive. So even if the rates of new infections are coming down, and the number of deaths is no longer as high as it used to be, the net effect is that the numbers are continuing to go up. Now, in the near future, many of these people will need new generation drugs because resistance would be coming, and the numbers with the resistance will gradually increase and keep on increasing. The threat that we are facing right now is that the new drugs that treat resistant HIV are now under trips that we have seen in the last part of the film. So they will not be accessible. And so the bloodbath will come again unless something dramatic is done. Uh, tribute to President Clinton. Uh, in his presidency, he talked about, uh, in the campaign for the second term, he talked about treating AIDS he only provided 300 million uh, US dollars, which was not even sufficient uh, to communicate to people about the AIDS. But he redeemed himself uh, later. He did a fantastic job when he started uh, uh, a job of AIDS activism. And uh, President Bush did a fantastic job. Nobody thought uh, that AIDS would ever get that kind of support and millions of people are now alive in Africa because of the action President Bush took. I have a, just a quick follow-up. Follow Can you tell me why the 50% of the population didn't take the drug? And, and what are the, the psych <coughs> behavioral... You know, the, the money is not sufficient to treat all the people who need the, who need. It's not sufficient. About 50%. Some latest statistics put it at about 55. The highest I've ever seen is about 60. So the money is not enough to treat all the people. So we need support for low-cost drugs. And to, surely, for, we, we have seen a demonstration that uh, AIDS can be treated and millions of lives can be saved. And surely, with this demonstration, we do not need laws that make it impossible for people uh, who need life-saving drugs to access it. So initially, only 50% could get the drug? 
Yes, at the moment about that number, the money that is available is only reaching, uh, is enough to reach about 50%. It has, it has been just a bit of, I think it's important to recognize we're only 54% there, but it has been a public health re revolution to go from 30,000 people on treatment in resource poor area to now 8 million. The threat is, are we going to make it to 100%? Can we afford the new generation drugs that Dr. Majeni just spoke about? And what are we going to do about similar diseases that we don't talk about as much, like drug-resistant TB, like Hep C, people who are still dying silently, and patent barriers are a part of the problem? Yeah, I'm part of a movement for revolution in this country and around the world. I spent a lot of time in, in Southern Africa and East Africa during the 1980s and went to Kampala, actually, and saw in the early stages of AIDS where it was just, you were traumatized if you had any sensibility about what was going on. And I think, I, the first thing I want to say is your film was just such a powerful indictment of this profit-driven system that the systematic depravity that allows so many people to die when it's preventable and I wanted to ask you, you know, when I saw the, there's the point about AIDS, there's also the, in the end of the film when it says 18 million people a year die of preventable diseases. This is, this can't be tolerated. And I, and I kept thinking about, even in Question, Africa, one of the sir? things I saw that was killing people, cholera, diarrhea, people dying from that. What do you see in addition to it? It was really helpful to understand what you said about the new generation of drugs, people needing further treatment. But what are the other front lines you think of where this is going to, where this is going to surface, it is going to come to the forefront again, where a huge kind of, you know, crisis is going to develop? And then what do you think people can do about this beyond, you know, relying on these imperial governments that clearly are in league with big pharma and make these rules immediately to stop anything that would threaten their profits? Uh, well, there's before, a, before a, yes. <laughs> it's a long one. <laughs> I, I just paraphrase. I paraphrase. Yes, the gentleman, you know, was just expressing, you know, his dismay at the fact that such a, a situation could exist, where, you know, we see 18 million people. It's roughly one third of all the deaths in the world, attributable to treatable and preventable diseases, mostly because of access to medicine. I mean, and I fully agree. This is a totally unacceptable situation. I mean, uh, and the root of the problem is monopoly. So, you know, I find it, yesterday I did an interview, and, you know, the gentleman uh, was very friendly, uh, and he said, you know, we Americans are real believers in the capitalist system, so, you know, how can you tell us that you know, we have to support, you know, treating poor people in other parts of the world? You know, that's an anathema to, you know, the belief system that we have. And my answer to him was, this has nothing to do with capitalism. Whether you believe in capitalism or not, monopoly is not part of capitalism. It's, you know, it is the antithesis of free market competition. Wherever there has been free market competition in medicine, you've seen the prices drop like a stone and people get access and get treatment. So, you know, I think there's, a, there's an irony here that this is one of the few, few situations where you'll see people on the right side of the spectrum, the conservative side of the spectrum, banging the drum for a government-granted monopoly, and people on the left side of the spectrum, you know, ballyhooing free market capitalism. I and mean, it's crazy. It's insane. But that's a situation that exists. Well, I can't put it better than you, 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 you put it. We have got this, an ESCO, an intolerable situation, whereby profit is put well above human lives. This is intolerable. This, it is not justified to say uh, companies need to make profit and that this would be a hindrance from them from making profit. Companies can still find ways of making profit. There are ways if millions and millions of people are treated at affordable costs, companies will still make some profit. They will make good profit. If they don't, uh, I don't think we can, as a people of the world, have a situation where people are deliberately being killed off and protected by law so that companies can make profits. This will be our last question. So how about in the back right there? Yes. 